thanks so much for inviting me again. I, I, I rarely get a second uh, uh, invite <laughs> after the first one, so I appreciate it. Uh, uh, anyway, as you know, uh, next week would have been the uh, Olympics in Japan, and we would have been excited. We could certainly use some sports, and I think that it would be worth discussing some of the great Olympians. And when you think of the, the great Olympians, I think you have to start off with Michael Phelps right up there, who I don't know if he would have been in this Olympics, but he certainly has made his mark in the last four or five of them. And what I did um, in, in, a, in a piece that, um, a recent piece, one of my works was, because I wanted to do a Michael Phelps piece, was uh, although he, um, uh, as you know, he's, he's uh, won 23 gold medals, which is unbelievable. Insane. Yeah, it's insane. In, insane. And um, he started uh, in, I believe, 2000 in Australia. And although he didn't win anything, pretty impressive for a 15-year-old kid to be at such an Olympics. Um, he then went on uh, to Athens, where he had, you know, I would say pretty good Olympics, six gold medals and two bronze. Uh, but I guess that his key year was, and the one that we think of is uh, 2008 in Beijing where he won eight gold medals, seven of them being uh, world records and one being an Olympic record. And when I, I just, think about him, um, I think you have to put rank him in the top athletes of all time, you know, in the top four or five, maybe top one you can make an argument for. Sure, um, oh yeah. So impressive. And uh, again, um, I'm not necessarily a sports, uh, not necessarily a swimming guy, but you had to, he was uh, an event when he came on, whether you were a swimming guy or not, you had to watch it. He was that special. And what I did in my piece, my most recent piece, was we incorporate, we have tickets from every one of, of Mark Smith, uh, that's, sorry, uh, of, of Michael Phelps. Yeah, that's a slip of the time. He defeats, uh, the interesting thing is he, he defeats Michael, Mark Smith's record at this particular Olympics, um, winning the eight, uh, uh, Spitz had won seven. And what, um, you know, what, what made it remarkable for me watching it was uh, uh, when you think about it, um, how much uh, energy is put in there. I, when I, when I used to love the, the, if you remember his ritual before each uh, uh, a match or each uh, swimming competition was that flapping motion he did as he got ready and prepared. I don't think there's anything more intimidating in sports than a competitor to watch him do that flap. Of right, his. right. Uh, it was just, I mean, I think of like Willie Horton maybe showing his muscles or Tiger Woods. <laughs> but but it, I would think it's half the guys wanted to go away right at that point. But um, when I think of that Olympics also, there were two really remarkable moments, I think. One of them was in the relay, uh, uh, there was one relay that, and he needed some help from his teammates. And um, his Jason Lasak came from behind to defeat, I believe a French uh, racer by, by a nose, if you will. And uh, I think, and he came from behind. And that really was something that support that, that Phelps needed to have his eight. So he really needed to thank uh, Mr. Lasak for that. And the other really memorable moment for me was in the butterfly. Uh, as you know, today we're having, uh, with, the, with the epidemic that we're having, um, we should, I certainly do, uh, wear a mask when I go outside. I think we all should uh, in terms of uh, 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 helping our fellow you know, uh, neighbors and, other, and, and friends as we try to fight this as best we can. And I have trouble breathing when I do it. I wear it, but I sometimes have tr trouble breathing out, out there. Imagine Michael Phelps, he dives into his, his, the butterfly and his goggles break. And he's filled with water, his goggles. He had to race almost at least half the race with water uh, in his eyes. He didn't know, he couldn't. And I would just think how disorienting that would be to me. Right. And he still was able to win the race. I think that's a pretty remarkable moment. So when we think about him and, and what he's done for the sport and, and, how, and, 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 and he won, I think he won like eight 
Swimmer of the Year uh, uh, medals. He won Sports Illustrated Man of the Year once in 2008. Um, he's just something that I think is one of the athletes that I think we always have to think about when we think about the great athletes in, in America. Well, I think when we, when we talk about him in particular and Olympic Games in general, we're looking at achievement that we don't see anywhere else. Sure, we've got Bob Beeman in the long jump that was, you know, out of this world. And we're Usain Bolt, which was insane. And when we're extending records and we're extending the way we see things, and it's not always Americans. I, I go to Teofield Stevenson in, the, in heavyweight boxing where it's like, this guy's untouchable. But he's not untouchable. You know, your father time's going to catch up with you at some point. Someone's going to throw a lucky left hook. You know, something's going to happen at some point. The thing that's the most impressive to me about Michael Phelps is, A, yes, he started that young, and he got a taste of how things were done. And then the last Olympics, to me, his last games, I think is the most impressive of all. Because he, A, tasted losing. He wasn't sure whether he's going to come back. So he actually got out of that athlete training mode probably from the age of 12 or younger. He was in that mode all the way up until that last games or this, that time off after the last games. And he was able to find that fire and still come back. And he wasn't as dominant, yet he was still dominant, which is even more impressive to me to be able to say, I was at the top. And I can still be at the top, but I can still also suffer the ebbs and flows of what's going on around me. And I, I was impressed with the way he reacted to things, not always the, positively, but he reacted to where it was, I'm going to keep moving forward. And he raised the level of his teammates, which if you've ever been to a swim meet, it's an individual team sport. And there's not a better way of putting it. You know, everyone's pulling together. But when you're in the water, you're in the water by yourself. So to be able to make that rest of the team, especially Olympic caliber athletes, raise their level is really impressive. Yeah, it certainly is. And when you, you think about it, was every time he went into swimming, he was a marked man. You, you always talk about how, um, you know, right. when, when, when the Bulls were great, even the worst teams would play their best game that day because they were playing right. the Bulls. So to, to know that everybody was given their best because it's Michael Phelps and he still wins almost everything. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he kept, and not only was he winning, he was breaking his own record over and over and over. Uh, over it's amazing. And that's, I, I that's catch, the impressive part. I happened to catch, um, uh, I watched some of the replays of it. And what was so interesting was they, they show, always show a red line where the Olympic record was or the world record was. And in almost all the swims, he's always passed that, uh, you right, know, right. ahead of that. And you just wonder, wow, is he going to tie her out or not? And he, and he generally didn't. Um, and, and he was just, you know, just uh, that, that amazing uh, uh, of a competition. And again, I, and again um, I don't know if he was scheduled to, to race in Japan. I think that would be about his sixth oh, Olympics yeah. or something like that. Uh, but, um, you know, even his last one in Rio, I guess – you know, it was uh, anticlimactic and only went five golds and one silver. So, right. you know, Well, you mentioned uh, something that's you, you mentioned something that's that's very important there. We get to the point where, okay, he's setting world records. Okay, he's winning whatever, blah 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 blah. But <coughs> excuse me, as he gets older, I won't say it's easy to win and defeat the competition because at that point, maybe have the competition intimidated. He's also defeating himself. Like you said, he has the world record. He wins in world record time. The thing that we always talk about in athletics, excuse me, athletics, especially track, swimming, those kind of things, is setting a personal best. But how often can you set a personal best? He set a personal best just about every time out. So not only is he competing against the field, he's competing with himself and beating himself. Yeah, I, I think in a way, you know, I, I would imagine, and I hear this a lot with athletes, is, you know, the competition was fun because he was, he's, his exercise schedule uh, apparently was very intense. And, you know, we're talking hours and hours each day. I can, it's hard to imagine. I can understand how a person like that can be burnt out. And it happens to some athletes. But oh, yeah. um, 
he's able to, you know, seem to get re-energized uh, around the time of the Olympics. And again, you know, swimming is really, I, I imagine, I don't follow so much the world championships, which I, which I know can be probably wonderful, but it's the Olympics. That's what you think of for swimming and for gymnastics and things like that. And, you know, I put his record of 23 gold medals, granted they, they have more events that they can do than some other athletes. That has to be up there with, you know, Joe DiMaggio, the 56 game hitting streak, oh, yeah. which I yeah. talk, we can talk about later, or, or uh, you know, to me, Hank Aaron's home run, uh, uh, you know, d overtaking Babe Ruth. Um, and uh, those are records that I think would be very hard to break. Well, it's sustained excellence over an amount of time, but it's also sustained dominance. The only thing I can really compare to is this Tiger Woods, really, because you're, he's looking at A, being having the most majors, B, also having the most tournament wins, or uh, tour wins. Now, if you can do that over the course of time, and, you know, we thought it might happen when he was in his 30s, but now he's in his 40s, but it's still a possibility. So that's the same, you know, roughly the same kind of time frame of, of Michael Phelps. If it's in five games or four games, that's 16 years. So, you know, that's pretty impressive. And, and you mentioned Mark Spitz. And yes. it's funny because when this, – this is the key thing right there. We don't mention Ian Thorpe anymore. Did, like he didn't exist. The Thorpeinator or whatever they call him. I think yeah. I was it. We don't I mention think. Mark Spitz. Yeah. We don't, we don't talk about Mark Spitz in the same way that we used to because this guy has come along and changed the landscape. Now, when you can do that – and I know we throw the word goat around quite a bit nowadays. But when you can do that when – the, the, the gold standard, no pun intended, is now somebody else. That's pretty impressive. That's why when we talk about Usain Bolt, we go, wait a second. Did he do what I just thought I saw him do? Wow. That's insane. Not just breaking world records, but doing it over the span of Olympiads mm -hmm. and doing it in multiple events and, and whatnot. Those are the people you go, this is impressive. Yeah, and, and you know what? And, and they – in, in, in generally, uh, although he had many events, these Olympians, um, you know, generally have, they practice, some of them practice their whole lives just for one, one event, you know, one, one mm -hmm. moment. And, um, you know, you can't, you gotta, you, gotta, you can't, blow, you know, and that's why uh, moving on to some of the other great Olympian things that I've been doing on, one is, uh, of course, the Michael Phelps, which we've spoken about, and you know, one of the great athletes, and I'm happy that I'm able to do a piece sort of celebrating some of his accomplishments. I think they're, you know, they should be. And um, also, I'm currently working on moving to the, to the ice, uh, to the uh, Winter Olympics for a second. I'm probably the greatest team uh, argument, uh, the team, uh, 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 the greatest accomplishment by a, by a team was the mir miracle at the Blake Placid. Uh, in 1980, and um, I was actually a, a sophomore at the University of Wisconsin, and it, uh, it was somewhat important to me because two of the players on that U USA hockey team were Badgers, uh, Mark Johnson, and unfortunately the late Bobby Souter, who, who's passed away. Um, and uh, when I think about that event, um, I also, one thing I remember about it was it wasn't televised live. So right. when we right. were getting reports that they were winning or, or something like that, or it was a competitive game. And I actually, when I watched it, I knew that they had won, but I still couldn't believe it. So you're watching right. it and you're not sure if they're going to win it or not. And um, to, to, to remember um, uh, beating this incredible Russian dominant team, you got to remember another thing that's really interesting when I went doing my research on it. And by the way, I have all the tickets from all the, um, uh, the games they played at Lake Placid. I, I did a, oh, that. great. So that's going to be a great piece. That's still got something to do. But what I also remember was about two weeks earlier at Madison Square Garden in a practice game, the, the Russian team demolished the U.S. team 10 to 3. Now, you know, the, and, and when they played in the semifinal game against the USA team, they demolished everybody like 55 to 10 and goal scored. I can understand why the Russians might have been a little overconfident. Sure. You know? Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that might have, you know, I'm not saying Brooks did that purposefully, but if he did, he was, he, it adds more to his magic. Um, 
And the other thing was when I, I, I was re listening to, uh, an, uh, uh, to the Russian point of view, I, was, I listened to a video and they were like, you know, as bewildered as everybody else. They thought, it, you know, gold medal was theirs as it had been for like 30 years or whatever, um, especially after they beat the, the, the U.S. team. I think you got to remember, they, since they beat the U.S. team, plus it was almost like a hockey, uh, a high school hockey rink. I mean, it wasn't, I right. don't know, they had 2,500 people. It was very, it wasn't a big place. It was sort of anticlimactic for these guys who were playing in the greatest rinks around the country. But one of the key moments, I think, was uh, late in the first period, the, um, the Russians were ahead two to one. And Mark Johnson and a fluke goal scored with about a second to go at the end of the first period. And the Russians, what did they do? They took out their goalie, Tretiak. I think his name is Tretiak. Tretiak. Yeah. And the, probably, uh, uh, without question, the greatest goalie of his generation. And, it's tra and they talked to the Russian players and they said that when he was taken out, what was the feeling of the other Russian players? They said, well, you know, we're Russian. We, we can't really talk yeah. back. But, right. but we were all going like, what is he doing? Uh, as Tradiac said, when I give up a fluke goal, that generally means I'm going to shut out the rest of the way. Um, right, right. And the chances are that, you know, like you often hear that a team could beat another team, you know, one out of a one out of a hundred times. And you wonder what that means. But I got a feeling that if that, if there was really truth to that, it would have been this USA hockey team against this Russian team. Um, and uh, so we were fortunate to put that all together. And of course, uh, Al Michaels makes the famous call, Do You Believe in Miracles? Uh, it may be one of the most famous uh, uh, broadcasting phrases ever made during a competition. So we were, um, we're pretty proud about putting that together. Uh, and hopefully that'll be done in another you know, two to three okay. months. We've got a lot right. of the pieces together. Believe it or not, when I'm trying, what the one piece that I'm trying to get, maybe your audience could help me, um, I am actually trying to get a ticket or a program from that Madison Square Garden game where the USA team lost 10 to 3. I think that would be great to add it in to the piece to show the, the, the change, the, the major change and right. what a shock it was when the USA team won. Well, the, the one thing that I get from that whole situation, and I kind of said I saw the same thing on ESPN that you saw as far as the Russian point of view, but here's what I thought was pretty cool. First of all, I remember, again, I'm a sports guy, and I'm, I was still in high school when that was going on. And I remember the, when they came on and they were talking about the Olympic hockey team. And it's like, well, yeah, whatever. It's hockey. Who's watching hockey? You know, yeah. there were like five NHL teams at the same time at, the, at that point. But they mentioned, okay, the last time we had the Olympics at Lake Placid, Lake Placid we won the gold medal right. in 1960. And, and the statement was, and it's probably not going to happen this time. You know, be happy that you won that one. 20 years later, you're not winning one. That was the overriding thing. Whatever they mentioned 1960, they said, and so we've got that going for us, which is nice. And that's it. And then, like you said, you have that situation. And then you get a little backstory of, of where the Russians came from. They became the dominant team because they beat Team Canada in a world championship and with Canadian – uh, NHL players, which were the best players in the world at that time, and the Canadian team came in and kicked their butts. They're like, whoa. You know, and the names that they throw out there of the, of the Canadian players, like you know, Gretzky and Orr, and people are like, wow, this is pretty impressive, right? So this is, this is good. They're a good team. And so if they were overconfident, which is understandable because they've already beaten the NHL pros, they have to think about that for a second. They've beaten the yeah. NHL pros, and now in front of us are a bunch of college kids that, you know, are probably not going to make the NHL. At least that would be the assumption. They're American college kids. Americans don't play hockey. You know, they're not going to make the pros. You might get one or two, but that's about it. You know, at that point, it was rare for even Canadian, an American player to be drafted in the first round of the NHL draft. You know, so yeah, we're not looking at, the, at that juggernaut of a team. And yeah, then, and, as and you all, said, oh, go uh, ahead. the only thing I would say, couple, just a couple of things, you, you, you make some great points. And um, uh, one thing I would tell you, you may not know this, but you know, with the 1960 team that the beat, the, beat the Russians, the last cut on that team was Herb Brooks. Right, he, right. And, and so he comes in and 
also, you know, the Russia USA politics is involved. I think they had right. just the Russians had recently gone into Afghanistan. I think something to that effect. So there was a problem there polit politically. There was even talk, I think, and eventually, I think it it, it moved on because uh, the it got to a point where uh, again. Um, the U.S. team did not go to Moscow a few years later, I believe, because of that. Um, but also, um, uh, the point, one thing is that that type of victory, which is so special, can't happen anymore because right. we play pros. Right. And one of the things I thought, when, even when the, the great USA basketball team that everybody talks about went to the Olympics uh, and, and beat the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, won the gold medal, against inferior teams by like 60 points or something like that. Um, eventually, I, I even when that, that, that dream team did play and everybody was so happy about it, for me, I was a little bit, I, I was, it bothered me a little bit because first of all, I love the college kids playing. Right. And I, I and victories like the USA hockey thing can't happen anymore because you're not gonna have college kids anymore, play, or, or maybe one or two. And you're not going to have that in, 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 in basketball either. And the other thing is sometimes things that seem so great can come back and bite you because um, the, the dream team, I think, won by an average of 50 points a game. I think four years later, they're winning by 25 points a game. Then they like 12 points. Now it's now, you know, the USA going to the Olympics is not a set thing. They're going to win it. Right. Um, and it's, it may be a great thing. It shows you how the world is caught up. But if we wanted to show our dominance and that's our game, we may lose the championship in our game very soon. Well, and there's another part of that as well. You mentioned Herb Brooks getting cut. Um, four years later, he doesn't have a chance. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. You had your time as an athlete to make an Olympic team in, in those sports, basketball, hockey, whatever. Uh, you would think that a great Olympian would have been a Luau Cinder. He missed that time, you know, or a Pete Maravich or any number of people. But the Olympics were held in years when they weren't at their peak and they didn't have another four years to hit it. Now you've got the pros, you know, you can play on three, four, six Olympic teams as long as you're still on the top pros. So that kind of special feeling of I made an Olympic team, again, going back to this hockey team, the 80 hockey team, you know, those guys – were handpicked by Herb Brooks, and that was that team. That was a, he could have had other players, but he chose those guys because that was the team he wanted. And then four as a years matter later, of fact, yeah, sorry, go ahead. That's all right. Go ahead. I was going to say, as a matter of fact, uh, although he 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 played a lot of his own players, uh, go, Gophers, which had won the national championship, I believe that year, his probably his most critical move was playing Roger Craig. Uh, uh, Jim Craig. Jim, Jim Craig, Craig, sorry. Jim Craig as goalie, who was a Boston College goalie, um, as opposed to one of his own players, who was the backup goalie. And um, that was a critical move. People didn't know if he was going to do that. And it turned out he just felt that Craig was a better goalie. And at least for those two weeks, he was certainly magical, especially against the final uh, against the game against the, 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 the semifinals against the Russians. Which brings me to another point is, the, the victory uh, with the Russians was amazing and very important. But remember, they still had to play the, another game in order to win right. the gold medal against Finland. Right. People sometimes forget about that. And Finland, I believe, had a 2 nothing lead at one point, and they came back. So um, yeah, I think, I think uh, Herb Brooks said something to the effect in the, the second, third period of that final game. If you don't win this game, you'll never forgive yourselves for not right. winning it after beating exactly. it. Exactly, so, exactly. He, he did it and he came through and he was, he was just brilliant at that particular time. Um, and obviously we, we, we have uh, his autograph among all, along with the 24 players. And we, we even have the, the, the doctor and the, I think Nova grad who was very important to that team, making some critical decisions from them. But anyway, that team was very special. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so that's something that we're, we're happy to do, but you know what? When we think of Olympians, probably the greatest in many people's mind is Jesse Owens, the great Jesse Owens. Uh, the one uh, he has a few 
uh, connections with, with or, or similarities with Michael Phelps. And, and one of them, they were both, by the way, uh, had a nickname with bullet in it. Uh, uh, Jesse Owens was called the Buckeye Bullet. And um, uh, Michael Phelps was called right. the Baltimore Bullet. I'm not sure you can use bullet that much these days, but uh, and, and those were two nicknames for those two guys. Uh, and also they um, con uh, come into the scene as very young people. Jesse Owens had one had tied the world record in the uh, 100 meters at nine nine four, I believe, when he was still in high school. Uh, and and Michael Phelps obviously had world records when he was in high school, uh, or, or or when he was a teenager. So those are a couple of, of similarities. But reading about Mr. Owens, it's really special. First of all, I didn't know he came from Alabama, and his family, and his his middle name. By the way, his name is is really a. Uh, 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 James Cleveland Owens. And what happened was apparently the reason they called him Jesse was when he was in school, he tried to say JC for James Cleveland. And if the story's right. correct, his teacher thought he said Jesse. <laughs> so that's how we got the name Jesse Owens. Uh, anyway, uh, he becomes a super athlete in high school and he has a very, he has a, a, a coach who realizes his talents and apparently he had to work. He's, one, he's the youngest of 10 kids, so he worked after school. But his coach was nice enough to let him practice before school started. So he would do all his running before school and then, you know, uh, uh, be ready for, for the meets. But he wouldn't really practice after school. Ohio State takes him. They have to take him. But he didn't get a scholarship, which just amazed me uh, for, for other reasons. But before he goes to the Olympics, he actually has uh, – famous for one of the greatest 45 minutes I ever say in sports history. He won in the Big Ten Championship. He had set three world records uh, in the 100 meters, mm -hmm. the long jump, and I think the two 200 meters. Uh, and of course, we know he goes to Germany in 1936 and being uh, having such a great Olympics, he, he and by himself basically destroys the myth that they uh, Aryan superiority that Hitler was trying to to promote, um, and um, you know, I just think of what he accomplished uh, as as a hero to America, and again, how sort of the world events tie in. Uh, but it was it was pretty uh, uh, remarkable reading about his accomplishments uh, at, at, during this particular time. Well. I have a little tie-in to that. Um, okay. I'm from Mansfield, Ohio, where the Mihawk Relays are held. And his coming out party when he was in high school was at the Mihawk Relay. So they, they traveled, like, people travel from all over the world, but especially from around the, the Midwestern states. So he comes from Cleveland, and he just obliterates people in the Mihawk Relays. Now, here's the interesting part. That track is still in existence. So I've been on that track. Wow. Anyone can go out on the track now. But it's at uh, what was Malabar High School. Now it's a middle school. And it's, I mean, I grew up literally, you know, five miles away from there. And, and it's, it's the one same of those track? places where it's, a, it's, a, well, it's been resurfaced, but it's, it, they, okay. they've redone it in the last few years. But it was still the okay. same basic setup. So you can walk out on there and you kind of look around like, wow, history was made here. But even more impressive, because that was just the, the, the as he's growing up, I went to Ohio State University. Yeah. So... In Ohio, in Ohio Stadium, where he ran there, you could, at, at that point when I was in school, you could actually go out and run on the track. The track was still there. It wasn't moved over to the stadium, or to the Jesse Owens Stadium now. It was still in Ohio State Football Stadium. And, again, it had been resurfaced and all that, but you could actually see the points where, okay, in 45 minutes, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do this. First of all, you're winded. And you're running about eight times slower than he did. But you're thinking, wow, in that span of time in this stadium, he set three world records and completely changed the way we look at track and field. And you can imagine him walking across campus. And as you said, he, he wasn't really on scholarship, had to go to a job, all these things, and all the little plaques and memorabilia that are set up for him there. And you, you pass it every day, and sometimes you take it for granted. But then you walk by and go, I'm walking on the same path that Jesse Owens walked on. And you're thinking, this is pretty impressive. And then, obviously, when you know the rest of the story, it's just amazing that it, it was just a normal guy 
that yeah. because you you have that that kindred uh, setup, but then yeah. you went, he did extraordinary things. Amazing, really and, impressive. Uh, and we were really proud. We put together a piece for him. We have the tickets from all the uh, the gold medal uh, uh, accomplishments in Germany. We have some programs, his autograph, of course. Um, and it's an interesting thing. I didn't realize this, but he actually had possibly the first sponsorship in the history of sports. Adidas actually gave him some sneakers to wear. Uh, wow. I read I that recently. That. I don't know. I think, I think maybe uh, it, not quite what they did today, but it was all, uh, quite a, uh, that was one of the things I, I read recently that was, I thought jumped out at me. The other thing um, I think people just to, to show you the importance of, of, of sports in many ways and how it, it, it um, especially with social justice being such an important part of what's going on in America now. One of the interesting moments in the 1936 Olympics occurred in the four by 100. Uh, that day, a gentleman named Marty Glickman, who I grew up listening to as one of the great announcers, right. and, and Sam Stoller was supposed to run in the four by 100, two Jewish guys. And, and, and Glickman was a star uh, football player also at Syracuse. Uh, during, the, um, uh, during the conference, uh, that when the players, when they got together, an assistant coach named Dean Cromwell said that uh, we heard that the Germans, or this is what's been reported, are using two more sprinters in the 4 by 100 So we're replacing Glickman and Stoller with, uh, Robin, with, with uh, Owens and, and, and Metcalf. And it, it, was, it was stunned silence. Glickman and Stoller were shocked. Uh, uh, Stoller didn't say anything, but Glickman was a little bit more brash. So what are you talking about? We came here to run in this thing. What's it changed? And it was always thought that they, uh, it was one thing for a black man to win. They didn't want to embarrass Hitler with two Jewish runners. So all of a sudden there's a big to do here. And uh, so, so uh, Jesse Owen speaks. And he says, listen, I won my, my 100. I won the 200, the long jump. I'm tired. Now, whether he was or he wasn't, and just being a, a gracious about it. Right. He said, uh, he said Marty, Marty and Sam deserve this. They're supposed to run in this. And from what's told, Dean Cromwell just looked at him and said, you do as you're told. And I don't think you get away with that these days. But um, everybody was sort of put back. And so when the race happened, of course, it's a great victory for Jesse Owens and Metcalf and the team, but it was striking how much it affected uh, Glickman and, 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 and Stoller. They, to this day, they're the only two Olympians who made, who were, you know, not ultimates, but actually members of the team who have not competed in an Olympics. And I think that's, that's an interesting aspect of this. Um, and, and Glickman took it to his grave being very angry. Um, and uh, they feel that Avery Brundage was anti-Semitic and didn't want it to happen. Uh, I've been always curious to look and see if any other Jewish athletes in any other, uh, from any other countries competed during that time. But I don't know. Um, but in any event, I thought that was an interesting part of our history and what happened in that Olympics. Marty Glickman, by the way, he was only 19 years old. He was a, a, or he was a freshman at, at Syracuse as, as being a brash kid that he was. He said, I was very angry, but I knew that in 1940, I'd still be a young man and be ready to get my gold medal. And of course, um, the, the war happens and he never gets his chance. And like you said, you know, these Olympics just come up, these events sometimes only get one chance. And to have it taken from you like that, that had to be, that had to be very tough for, for Glickman and Stoller to go their whole lives with that. But the idea that, that Marty Glickman goes from being, you know, having that happen, and then still being in the public eye for the rest of his adult life. Because anyone that knows sports, you know, knows Marty Glickman and knows what Marty has accomplished. But he still yeah. has that part of his backdrop there that he's got to be worried about or is in his head, you know, as he's championing other people. That's got to be a, a tough life to live. Yeah. And he was, you know, it's funny. I Growing up in New York, uh, in, in the, uh, and being a New York football giant fan, uh, again, today's kids don't understand it, but the home games were blacked out. Right. So uh, when my father, would go, he had season tickets, he would go, I would listen to the radio, and it was always Marty Glickman. And right. he, he had this incredible, almost staccato voice or whatever. He made, 
you feel like you were in the huddle or something. He, he had this just amazing voice, for, especially for football. And I still remember, and I don't know if people do this so much, maybe they do when, with Vince Scully, even when the, um, the giant games were on regular TV, my father would turn up the volume yep. and we would listen to Marty Glickman on the radio. You know, uh, and I didn't know he was an athlete uh, I, until later on. I mean, right. all this, you know, he, he didn't parade this too much. I only learned about it much later in my life than, than when I was a kid. But, um, you know, he, he um, you know, was, was, you know, was uh, not only a great broadcaster, but apparently a really superior uh, athlete, too. And he had such a long and distinguished uh, broadcasting career that you tend to forget that he did something before that. Yeah, well, speak, my, my father would do the same thing with the Indians baseball games. He would turn oh, yeah. the sound down on TV and listen to yeah. Joe Tate on, on the radio. So, yeah, I, and I grew up with that, too. It's like, well, Dad, do you know the TV's got sound on it? Better to listen to it on the radio. Like, okay. And then he'd sit, sit down and score the game with me. Like, but I'm watching it. I don't need to score the game. Well, <laughs> we want to talk about it later. But we're talking about it now. But I understand what he's doing then, you know. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there, but there, there are so many things that, you know, as we talk about the Olympics, and I don't want to get into a lot of different things, but – um, I think I was six years old, or not even six, five years old, the 72 Munich games. And we were visiting uh, relatives or, or friends of the family. And, you know, I'm a little kid, so all the kids were out running around outside, playing around, you know, chasing each other, whatever. I'm the youngest of everyone around there, so I'm wondering what's going on. It gets dark. Now, I'm going to have to do the math on this, because this is what I think I remember, but I'm not entirely sure that it's right. I was talking to my brother about this the other day that it, it, it gets dark, so we all come inside, and the Olympics are on. And I don't know anything about the Olympics, though I know it's sports. So I'm like, sports are on. You know, my family likes sports. I'm going to watch sports. And then at some point, not too long after we came inside, they told all the kids to leave the room and go back outside again, and it's dark outside. And I find out that that's when, if I'm reading this right, is when the uh, Olympic athletes from the, the Israeli athletes were – were captured and, and all that happened, and Jimmy McKay came yeah. on and all that. Now, it, it, I'm not sure if that is actually the time frame of it, but it sounds about right. Um, and that's an, another important event in the Olympics that we tend to want the Olympics to be non-political, but they aren't. And as you mentioned, the Moscow, you know, uh, as we're watching that that special with the um, with the the Russian hockey players of that team, it's like okay, we're playing here. But we'd already decided that during that Olympiads, we were going to boycott the Moscow Games and the Summer Games. So, and then, of course, in turn, the, the Russians boycott the Los Angeles Games and yeah. so on and so forth and all that. So there's so much that happens that yeah. is more important. And I think that's why we like the Olympics. Again, Jesse Owens is a political statement, even though he may not have meant for it to be. It is a political statement because that's what – Hitler and the Russia, and the, I'm sorry, the Germans were trying to make, you know, we're making the political statement, the East Germans and the West Germans and, you know, all that with the swimmers and so many things. So. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder, I, I, yeah, you, you make some good, by the way, these, the Olympics um, that the, the, the Munich Olympics is, is the Olympics you're talking about um, when the Israeli athletes sadly were, 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 were uh, kidnapped and then, then killed. But, um, that was also the Olympics when Mike, Mark, uh, Mark Spitz won all his gold medal. And being that he was a Jewish athlete, uh, he, uh, he had, I think, completed all his events by the time that it happened. The, he was, um, I think, quickly escorted out of the uh, Olympics by the Americans um, even before the Olympics ended because they were afraid, uh, I think, of him being, uh, that he may have been on the list or somebody if who... Who might, if who I remember right, he got out a, a day before everything yeah, happened, right? Something like that. Now, um, what I always thought about how interesting history would have been if Glickman or Stoller had been on that four by one hundred team, with mm -hmm. predominantly would it be all black, all black, and all Jewish team defeating Hitler. That would have been, I think, an interesting part of history. Uh, but it still is still pretty special moment, uh, especially uh, for what, what Mr. Owens did. Now, another thing that I thought was uh, sort of interesting was um, when I did this was 
in one of his events, I think it was the 200 meter sprint that he won. Who comes in second but Mac Robinson? Right. Now, Mac Robinson is Jackie Robinson's older brother. So this is in 1936. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, we always think of Jackie Robinson, Jackie Robinson, but up to 1947, I imagine if you thought of a Robinson, you probably thought of Mac Robinson. Mac Robinson, exactly, right. You know, he was a great athlete himself, and he, and he, and he won a, a, a Olympic medals. Uh, and so I thought that was interesting. And um, when you think, uh, uh, so I, I just, you know, when we go into records now, if we move into records a little bit, I think, you know, we, we, we shared some of the great ones in the Olympics between uh, Phelps and, and even Mark Spitz, we mentioned, and of course, uh, Jesse Owens and the USA hockey team. But all, all I think why, one of the reasons I've got into the, it, doing my display things is these are all special moments in history, not just sports history, but American history. And uh, that's why I love putting my displays together because I want to bring this history uh, although a lot of people remember it, many people, a lot of people don't more than right, I more right. than I'd like to think, and so we're trying to do our best to bring it back to the forefront of people. And these are great stories. These are great, great American stories. What they accomplish, and well, um, well, you mentioned one as far as things that we should know historically that we don't really pay attention to, and the one, and I haven't, I've connected with it, but I haven't had a chance to put it together yet, is Dick Fosbury. Yes. Fosbury Flock, the 68 Olympics in Mexico City, yeah. where we completely – now, this is something that you really have to think about. But up until 1968, everybody high-jumped the same basic way, the Western roll or, or whatever you wanted to do. But it was – you went face first over the bar. It doesn't change. That's the way it's always done. That's it. That's all. From 1968 – to the rest of life, it's the Fosbury flop. And I don't know if anyone else, and I, I, I'd have to research this, it goes from one guy doing it to everybody else doing it immediately. It's amazing. Yes. It's, it that is amazing. White Stones in 76 and all that. And like, it just changed. The Catholics are doing a Fosbury flop. It's just, boom, done, over with. This is the new way of doing it. It's completely different. Everybody's doing that. It, it's it's amazing how a single person can uh, with showing tremendous individuality because he had to go against set regulations and rules. Right. He did that. I mean, there are moments like that. Sometimes you possibly and they're, they're not exactly the same as that. Is um you know I I, I don't know if it's Bob Cousy, but it may, it may have been one other person who who developed the behind the back dribble that now is like commonplace and right. nobody did that right. I think until like the early fifties or. The, the, uh, the soccer style field goal kickers, you know, they, right. I don't know when that came in. So now, about, now probably 90% do that. So there's certain things that all of a sudden change. And now we take for, for take for granted, but somebody had to be because of his creativity and most importantly, it worked, <laughs> you know, right. if, well, if, and that's the thing, right? Yeah. If, 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 if he had done it, it would have been really a, a flop, you know, but right. Um, uh, so it's interesting, like one of those moments that just change a sport, the very few athletes who can say that they change the sport, but I mean, uh, he certainly did in that event. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it is to be noteworthy. Now, um, you know, probably the, the, the most important moment in sports, I, I think you'd argue is Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. It just did so much because it was, not just a thing for, for in sports, but it sort of changed so much more in American life uh, and how, how things were, were, were celebrated, uh, you know, bringing the black athlete into Major League Baseball and uh, what he went through and all that. And, uh, you know, I've always kind of curious, being so, he was so successful, what would have happened if Jackie Robinson turned out to be, you know, a 200 hitter or something you know, or, or a modest player, or maybe even, you know, lesser than that, you know, you know, would that have changed history? Probably not because you had Larry Doby and other players most likely. Well, I was, I was going to say that. I mean, but it, it, it would Larry Doby have been the one to carry the torch if there hadn't been, I mean, but no, your, your point, okay, so, I, 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 I agree with, uh, 
that assessment. And, and also, you know, what's interesting how um, Branch Ricky, and this is, you know, you could debate it or not because there were better ball players than Jackie Robinson, uh, or at least, but he was still the right player of uh, being so Our educated, right. being a college kid. kid. Um, and uh, I always went, my only thought was he was a really good football player. And obviously in the 19, still in the late 40s, the two main sports in America were boxing and baseball in terms of making money, any money. You know, today, if, right. if, he'd come, if he was in college, I don't know if he might have gotten to football. Who knows? Well, and the interesting thing about all of it is that, again, it's the timing of it. Because if That's it's right, time. another five years, we've got the NFL or the AAFC and the NFL and all that stuff, it, that, that the NFL is now taking off. We have the NBA taking off in the mid early 50s. And all these things might have changed that whole dynamic. But like you said, at that point, the NFL wasn't really the NFL that we've grown yeah. to understand. And it was – so if you're going to integrate something, if you're going to make something that impressive of a jump, you go to baseball. And as you said, you, you couldn't have taken, you know, Satchel Page or – or cool Papa Bell, or you could have taken a lot of other people who would have been able to have probably been successful as players. Yeah. But maybe they wouldn't have been able to do the things that Jackie Robinson was asked to do or asked not to yeah. do. So, and, and what it also shows is the disparity. If Jackie Robinson comes in and is as dominant of a player as he was, what does that tell you? Or what does that tell society at that point? You know, like, okay, this guy's coming, he's really good, but there are about another three or four dozen that were as good or better than him in that league that you weren't going to watch, you know. So to me, that's, that's pretty impressive in itself. You know, here's a thought that just occurred to me while we were going through that. It could be one of your displays or it could be something that we could do as a show. Just think about the, the people that have changed sport, that – it, like Dick Fosbury, one day it was this way, the next day it wasn't. You know, the, the, I, and I, I look at, I don't know if the Bob Beeman jump fits that because I think that's just an outlier of what happened in Mexico City. But maybe the Mexico City games are an outlier of the Olympics. I don't know. You know, you've got Hank Lucetti with the, with the uh, single-hand jump shot. You know, as you, you mentioned, a couple other people like that, Bob Cousy, you know, um, Bruce, Bruce Splitter and the, and the Splitter. You know, is, is, is that change everything, you know? It was, yeah, it's, I mean, it's I'm interesting. sure he wasn't the first one to throw it, but. I think, you yeah, know, those are interesting things to do. Um, the question uh, is uh, changing perception and, and changing the way uh, the game is played is very important. Uh, although I think that if you could tie that with records, records, for example, um, I'm working on what I call this, and I think I mentioned this to you before, the single most important one-day record. Uh, you could maybe you could maybe I'm wrong because I, I after talking about Michael Phelps, maybe maybe it's Michael Phelps or or, or Jesse Owens doing the uh, the forty doing three events in 45 minutes. But I've always thought that the single greatest uh, uh, record for one particular game is Will Chamberlain's 100 point. Uh, Mark, oh, I yeah. think that's, yeah. I think, I don't know how you, you, you could argue that, but I, I still put it that number one. So we're working on that piece. I've made it, I'm, I'm, by the way, if you, if you could ever find me an autograph by a guy named Al Butler, who was a, who played at Niagara and then played with the Knicks in 62. That's one of the few autographs I'm still looking for. But um, uh, I, what I'm trying to do my hundred point piece game is um, I got the ticket, which very rare, you know, comes from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, I got a piece of the floor from Hershey. I got a pennant. And I got the autograph of all the players who played on both teams. So um, uh, I'm just looking for a couple more things now. And that's going to be a very impressive piece, I think. Uh, 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 records, I put Joe Dimagine's 56-game hitting streak up there. Uh, but that's, again, off for a season. Some ways, right. so, some ways that's even – some ways you can almost argue that's even more impressive than a one-game thing. So. but. Yeah. But and the other thing that's interesting about Joe Dimaggio's 56 game hitting streak, supposedly, and I've read this, I talked to Marty about the Yankees, and he thinks there's some truth to it. He, if he had gotten, if he had, if he had made it 57 games and stopped, he was supposedly going to get a big, um, 
bonus or, or ten thousand dollars from Heinz fifty seven. Heinz fifty seven, right? <laughs> and, and you know what's amazing is generally you always wonder. You see it often in in bowl games and one game players when a when a team you know comes from like twenty points behind to tie the game up and then they kind of fall back, putting like spending all that energy, or uh, a pitcher you know going like eight innings and he can't he's lost he's lost his gas, but. Um, DiMaggio, after the 56 game hitting streak, he and he got he really got robbed by by Kenny Keltner, Lou Boudreau, people like that in, in, in that 57th game. He then goes on for I think another 16 or 17 games. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's a pretty amazing. That's being in the zone. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> you know, being in the zone for I, I mean, I, I remember playing basketball in the streets of Alberta. I'd be in the zone for like maybe five minutes, not for, <laughs> not for five months. <laughs> well, I, I I add the uh, the the day that Usain Bolt had, where he okay. sets the record in the hundred, then the two hundred, yeah. and the yeah. two hundred, the if you split the two hundred apart, he ran the hundreds if the hundred meter splits faster than he ran the hundred. Wow! And that's wow. I mean, I mean if you do the math, it's like if you divide that in half, he ran the two. No, that's not possible. And so you really, I think it was 19.3 or something like that. It's like, 19.3, what the heck? No, that's, no, I can't be right. So you look at that and go, that's really just unbelievable what, what he was able to do. And the fact that. And, it, you know, sometimes it just happens that you have, like, a great name. And the name Bolt is, like, perfect for him. Well, and, and also understanding in one of and I'm I'm, I'm going to get my Olympics mixed up, but in one of those races, everybody ran a sub ten, or sub nine something or whatever. The right. the fastest times in history, like six of the fastest times in history or something like that, were running in that <coughs> race, and he won going away. You know, so there is another one. Um, like you said, you've got the dream team. I don't know if that really, it, it's more important for what it became than what it was. I get that, but. You know, then you have the Nadia Komenich, you know, yeah. and, and and the fun thing that I was looking on something about that was I didn't realize Olga Corbett was still competing in the 76 games. I, I do faintly remember that. I And I think she won a bronze or something. She, I think she won a silver in the vault or something like that. So yeah, something like that. Yeah. She still did. But, you know, that's a sport that um, it shows you again the longevity, especially of, of a Michael Phelps for five or six Olympics. I mean, gymnastics seems to be like you got your one Olympics and because of growth or whatever. Uh, yeah, right, right. You know, it, it's it's going to be, you know, you don't have a long career. And, and, and generally they're, I mean, the, the amazing thing is the poise these, they have at 13, 14, and 15, you know, these, these younger ladies. So, um, you know, it's impressive. But, uh, you know, so uh, anyway, it's unfortunate that we don't have the Olympics to actually watch this year. Uh, to see these great athletes, and there's always somebody who comes out of nowhere that takes over the country and takes over the world. And uh, you know, for two weeks we get a break from all the all the things that are going on in the world, which aren't always so great. So um, it looks like they guess they're gunning for next year to have a one year delay. Um, so we'll we'll hopefully get the Olympics. Yeah, and I don't I don't think Phelps is supposed to, but who knows. <laughs> if he gets time to, to go I mean, back, who knows? Tell him, no. who's right. tell him you, no. you can't make the team. Well, it, it's interesting to look at how it's going to be set up because, as we said, you know, you have that window of opportunity, um, whether it be two years or a year or four years or whatever, and people that have sacrificed to make it this year, this week, they wanted to peak it this week, now we're going to have yeah. to go through it all again, and that's, you know, graduation or – or families, or what, everything else is going to have to be put on hold for another year. And the the reports that I'm hearing out of out of uh, what's going on next year doesn't look that positive next year either. That there's still yeah, a possibility it, that they that almost like the host team host city says, you know, we don't want it now. Now I, I'm not saying that that's set in stone, but I've I've heard some of that. It's like, you know, it, it's not going to be worth it now. So, you know. Wow, well, you know, you, you almost wonder if the down the road and, and I think it's kind of neat having it go from one place in the world to another but you always wonder because of finances and because of issues that perhaps they'll have like one place like in, in Greece or Rome or something 
and it be there every four years. I don't know. Well, it's an interesting concept to think about because once we've seen, you know, some places like it was the Saddle Dome in Calgary, they were able to repurpose that. Yeah. But like in uh, Sarajevo, there's – you see the pictures of what happened there, and you go, is this where the Olympics were? Oh, my. And it just was – we had Olympics, and now there's nothing. And it's even worse than it was before. Um, so I, if I remember right, was it the story I heard that, that Novak Djokovic practiced in the swimming pool from – to play, learn how to play tennis in the swimming pool that was bottom out from what was happening. I don't know. I'm, I might be making it up. I'm not sure. But the idea of there's, there's nothing there now. That infrastructure is gone. And how much it costs to put on the games and how much is – I mean, that's why it seems to make sense to have it here in the States because those stadiums already exist. You now, know. now, you can make a point. However, I will say one thing. Uh, you know, where we started this thing in a sense, the, talking about Olympics – in the games in Lake Placid, um, uh, where the athletes stay was quite inferior. Apparently, right. the, the Russians, when they were there, said we felt like we were in a prison. It, it, right. it, it felt, you know, like, you know, the worst things we hear about Russia. America. We thought being in the Red Army was bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. And as, what's amazing is uh, one of the players, I think, in Fedosov came back. They did a thing on one of the stations, I think ESPN did one of those shows from the Russian point of view of that yeah. loss. And he said, we always go to prison. And ironically, it is a prison now <laughs> where, they, yeah, where right. the dorms was, was turned into a prison. So he said, it's fitting, it's fitting because we hated that place. Uh, it was terrible, the, 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 the dorms were awful. It was like, you know, it was like psychologically, uh, it was the perfect uh, venue in a negative way for uh, a, a surprise victory to occur. Right, right. Uh, you know. and, and, and that brings us full circle. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll kind of leave it at that, uh, except for there's one thing that yes. I want to mention is that over your, I believe that's your right shoulder there. Uh, yes. There is a, uh, I see the, the title Opera and Baseball. Now you're going to have oh. to tell me something about that. Okay, well, one of the things that I like to do, and I'll just move it, I'm gonna. I, I usually don't put anything in front of Ruth and Harris, but I will for a second. <laughs> well, it still has Ruth, so it's okay. Yeah. One of the things that I do when, when I have my show, like uh, maybe it declares the way. Anyway, I did a. Um, I did a number of shows, a lot of book signings when I had my gallery here in New York, and. Uh, one of the shows I did was a little bit unique was um, a show, believe it or not, showing the connections between baseball and opera. Yeah, I know there's a pause, but it's Big really pause, interesting. Right. And my feeling has always been, if I could connect baseball to opera, then I can connect baseball to anything. To anything, and right. To anything. And um, I, I think baseball is, you know, one of the great, you know, as, is, is truly our national pastime. Uh, and anyway, I had a, a man walk into my gallery uh, and we spoke a little bit. And it turns out he worked for the Metropolitan Opera House and he was also a baseball guy. And he uh, uh, goes around giving lectures into, uh, on the subject of baseball and opera. And we did it. Um, and I'm going to send you the link uh, and you can give it to your audience. Uh, we, it was about 45 minutes showing the connection a baseball opera, and it was really fascinating. And um, the uh, one of as I as I um, have told some people, the ones that I can remember include um, if, for example, you wanted to uh, get the results of a baseball game in 1870, 1880s, really early baseball. There's no TV, no radio. The only place that had the telegraph wires were were the, at the opera house, and you would get the results at the opera house of the baseball games. And on occasion, a gentleman would relate, we would, would, would do, would, um, do the play-by-play -play of the whole game based on the reports that he was getting. So it, that I found fascinating, you know. Um, also, um, another thing was Lou Gehrig uh, on a day where the Yankees were rained out. A friend of his had a ticket to the opera, and Lou went. Right. And he fell in love with it because it was in German, and Lou Gehrig spoke German through, through his childhood, and he found it fascinating. And he would go to operas uh, throughout his life. 
uh, after that. But there's a lot more that, that you get to, to hear uh, in, the, in the audio, um, uh, and I hope you do, because uh, the funny thing was that when we had the show, we had like, it was like two opposing teams. We had half the audience was opera people on one side, half the, uh, the audience were baseball people on the other side. They didn't intermingle. You know, they, they thought they were each were foreigners in many ways. And by the end, you know, they were all, I think, enjoyed it. They didn't realize it. And um, uh, it was just something different. And, um, it, and, and a lot of times people leave early and sometimes they have to go places. Everybody stays to the end. So hopefully you get a chance to enjoy it yourself. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. We'll make sure everyone gets to take a look at that. Well, again, you know, this is always fun. Uh, and when I say right. always, it's only been twice, but I know I it's going to be more than I process. have to get used to my looking at myself. I'm not, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not used to that. <laughs> uh, I mean, that that's uh, well, poor, we'll, poor, we'll, poor, we'll get, we'll, we'll we'll get plenty of we'll look at it the whole time. So, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get plenty of practice. So anyway, always well, fun. Um, and, and by the way, if anybody I, ever wants to contact me, um, I think I said this before, but my, my email address is uh, njsart at msn.com. I'm always working on new pieces. As I said, working on the USA Hockey piece now, still working on uh, my, uh, my, my Will Chamberlain piece, working on a, uh, uh, a, a, the 1958 NFL uh, New York Giant Baltimore Colt famous football game, which actually, in reference to what we talked about earlier, was the changing point when football becomes recognized right. as a major uh, sport right. in America because of the connection with, with TV. And uh, so that was about 11 years uh, after Robinson breaks the color barrier. So that would have been interesting if that happened, you know, 11 so, years earlier. Was it? Right. right. Uh, and, uh, and, and I always appreciate it. Hopefully you, you enjoyed it. I always enjoy it. Oh, and I have a great time. Uh, and uh, we'll talk soon. And thank you again. Thanks, Neil. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye.